Okay, team. Uh, Mr. O here. We're going to start doing some AP review. Uh, this is based on the yellow packets that you have. Um, I'm going to do one topic at a time and walk you through everything that you need to know for that yellow packet. Um, this first video will be a little long. I promise you I will try to make the rest of them shorter as we go along. So here we go. We're going to start with developments in East Asia 1200 to 1450. This predominantly has to do with the Song Dynasty. Um, your first section is a spicy tea chart for the Song Dynasty. So you've got a whole lot of stuff to put down. There will be some rep repetition here, so I will kind of go over it. Make sure you use your pause button to write stuff down. Um, don't stress yourself out. Okay, so Song Dynasty, patriarchal society, male-dominated. Um, the land-owning elites are really the most powerful members of the social hierarchy. Um, <clears throat> and during the Song Dynasty, China experiences a huge population growth. Um, on the political side, again, the land-owning elites have the most power. Um, you do have the emperor at the top, but he is kind of in the thrall of these land-owning elites. Um, they use a tribute system um, with neighbors and also internally where people either pay uh, cash payments or in goods to the government um, to keep them from being invaded or whatever along those lines. Um, and Confucianism is really the backbone of Song Chinese rule. Um, there are the civil service exams um, that are required to become a member of the bureaucracy, um, and it is a very large bureaucracy. Um, on the interaction with the environment side, you have the Grand Canal, which I'll get into a little bit more detail later. Um, it is expanded. That increases trade between north and south, um, connected to two great rivers, um, and leads to an increase in trade. Okay. Moving on with the song. On the cultural side, you have Confucianism. Um, early on, it is infused with Buddhism. We'll talk about the, the problem that goes on with that in the advent of Neo-Confucianism shortly. Um, again, patriarchal society. Women have a lower standing. Um, the art of foot binding comes into play. Um, you have on the background here an example of Song Dynasty art. Um, it's a very, uh, and along with the the China there, uh, the porcelain that you see in the in insert. Um, China develops printing, um, first block printing and later movable type. Um, economically, they begin to use paper money. Um, trade along the Silk Road expands, especially in luxury goods like porcelain and silk. Um, you have the development of credit and banking houses, and this helps increase trade as money does not need to be transported. also makes trade safer. And then the reason for the population growth, the Champa rice. Um, this was introduced during this period. Um, it is a faster growing rice, and it allows for two crops a year, meaning you produce more, and when you have more food, you have more people. Okay, and then finally, technological innovations. <clears throat> um, in agriculture and manufacturing, you have steel production gets better. We'll get into that in a little later date uh, time. Chopper rice, um, I've already talked a little bit about. You have an advancement in metal production with pl better plows, weapons, and bridges. Um, more and better products getting made. The song really works to develop gunpowder and, as I already mentioned, printing. The tribute system. This is part of the biggest way China, uh, the Song, maintained and justified their rule. Um, other countries and people within China were expected to pay tribute, with either in goods or money, to the emperor um, as part of being under his rule. You had the Confucian bureaucracy, and then kind of the backbone of all that was the dynastic cycle, the Mandate of Heaven, which you learned about last year um, with Mrs. Delgado. Neo-Confucianism. Um, Confu right, the Confucianism at the start of the Song Dynasty, and this really begins actually really in the Tang Dynasty, uh, <clears throat> begins to change over the course of time. And what it, be, what it really is, um, it's really Neo-Confucianism repudiates the other belief systems of China, most significantly Taoism and Buddhism. And it really tries to create a more rationalist and a secular China. And takes a lot of the spirituality out of it, at least the governmental side of Confucianism. Um, and this is shown in the civil service exam. Um, and it reinforces the patriarchal society that is part of the Confucian ideal. 
okay getting continuing with Confucianism make sure you remember you, you look up and you check on those five relationships of Confucianism and how they lead to a male dominated society um, we taught we looked at early in the year foot binding um, where women were expected especially upper class women to keep their feet extremely small so that they could barely move um, and this was just a one way another way that women were subjugated um, and made to be second class because with these small little feet they certainly weren't out working in the fields or things like that lower class women this was not as common um, simply because they needed to have everybody out working in the fields okay um, religious diversity in China you basically have three versions of Buddhism and all of those are going against Neo-Confucianism. Make sure you get down these things here. Basically Theravada is kind of the original Buddhism. It stays more in India and Southeast Asia, more conservative, uh, more monastery based. Mahayana is the dominant one in China. Um, the Bodhisattvas were holy men. Um, and they, you followed them to become more enlightened, um, and really it was more of a personal thing, less of a, a universe thing. Tibetan Buddhism is really an offshoot of Mahayana. It's a more physical aspect, including the use of yoga. Um, and then Neo-Confucianism basically re re uh, rejects all that, and the last point should say it leads to a revival of classic Confucianism not Buddhism. I'll fi have to fix that on the slide. Okay. Um, the interactions with other places, and we're going to talk mostly with Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. Um, as you can see, Japan, there's a lot of cultural diffusion going on between all of them. All of them, Buddhism spreads there. Um, Japan and Vietnam, Confucianism comes in. Um, Korea and Japan take on the Chinese writing. Architecture comes in everywhere. Uh, Vietnam is the most influenced by the Chinese. Japan is probably the least, though you could make an argument for Korea um, because they try to remain very independent. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more. One of the things with Vietnam to keep in mind is that the Chinese conquered Vietnam. They conquered Korea on and off. They never conquered Japan. So some differences. Korea little cultural impact other than Buddhism. They don't adopt a lot of the uh, Confucian ideals. It's a more aristocratically controlled government, less emperor controlled, and they develop their own alphabet. Japan is much more selective. Um, they had a homegrown religion called Shinto, which is animus based. Um, it's more of a nature based religion. Um, Japan had the shogunates, which were more decentralized than the Chinese form of government. Remember that the emperor reigns but does not rule, which means he has actually very little power. The power is centralized with the shogunate and with the landowners. Japan was never conquered. They never paid tribute to China. That is not the case with Korea and Vietnam. Vietnam does develop its own language, does have greater role for women, but for the most part, because China ruled them for a thousand years, they are a lot closer culturally to the Chinese. Okay, so that is the, um, the belief systems on the historical impact. You have the Champa Rice uh, leading to population growth. You have the Grand Canal, which leads to increased trade. Uh, you have the steel and iron production increasing the output uh, of China, you have, uh, and the quality, you have textiles and porcel porcelains, which lead to a huge influx in the luxury trade, making China very wealthy. You've got filial piety, uh, respect for elders and the patriarchal society, and you've got gunpowder, which will eventually lead to a worldwide military revolution. So that's what you need to know about China for this period. Um, and we'll come back in the next video with uh, Islam.